There's one challenge that overshadows everything, and that is labor shortage. We are setting up teams that are focused on solving specific problems, pain points for the customers. Versatility is an absolute requirement now. Hi, I'm Joe Campbell, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this edition of the Roundtable Session, where we bring automation experts together to talk about topics around manufacturing, factory automation, and collaborative robots. I've got a great panel here today. We're going to have a very lively discussion. I'm joined by Fleur Nielsen, who is the Global Head of Communications for Universal, Casper Anderson from our Innovation Labs, Lacey Ferry, Global Head of Product Marketing, and last but not least, Kim Paulson, our CEO and President. Looking forward to a great session today. Could you, could you talk about how we build this, this culture of innovation? Because it seems to permeate everything in UR. Innovation is really a big part of the culture in UR, right? We're, we're a company that in general is just driven by difficult problems. How can we solve difficult problems and can we use cutting edge technology to solve them? That's great. But it really comes down to a couple of things. It comes down to first and foremost, I would say talent. You need to have talented people. If you have talented people, you figure out what mountain to climb and they'll tell you how to climb it. Fortunately for us, we have a lot of talented people in UR and yeah. talent attracts talent, so we keep adding on and this is great. Second, it's keeping that spirit of a startup. You know, as we're getting bigger and bigger as a company, we need to maintain that, you know, sense of uh, one, urgency, and two, that, hey, anything is possible, right? And not becoming too heavy on big processes, things like that. So really the spirit of a startup, anything can be done, we'll figure it out, that's a key thing. And third, we, the way we do engineering is through what we call empowered teams. So that means they get the freedom to figure out how to solve the hard problems. And that's really a key thing. And last, I would say, but not least, is that the engineering teams, every single week, they go out and they spend time with real customers, with real problems. Yeah, that, that's just an important part of doing innovation is to get in front of the customer, learn about the problems, understand their journey or the pain points and find the right solutions for them. We are setting up teams that are focused on solving specific problems, pain points for the customers and give them the empowerment and the capabilities by having cross-functional teams that have all it takes to get and solve that problem for the customer. Well, I thought one of the things that most impressed me, and, and this is a change in the culture since I've been in the company, which is only four years, uh, we recently brought a concept robot, not a production model, right, but a concept robot to a major trade show strictly to get customer feedback, and I thought that was amazing. It was really, really great to get out uh, really early in the process and get the feedback from, uh, from the customers. So w what we did was we, we did a lot of research on, on this market. What is the need? What is the specifications that we need based on the customer's problems, right? And we then did this prototype. And instead of just sitting back in our office and iterate and iterate, we got it in front of customers and we got some really, really good uh, specific feedback. And yeah, that project is uh, just taking off. It's really awesome. Nice to hear, very nice to hear. We should also talk about the impact we're having on small and medium enterprise. Traditionally, we're used to seeing all of us, um, large industrial robots. They have entire groups at large companies where they're focused on automation solutions and they build their own quite commonly. Mm -hmm. um, but that solution left SMEs out of the mix because they either didn't have you know, the PhD level expertise required or they didn't have the large capital investment required to purchase one of those industrial robots. So you know, with Cobots, um, we brought the first commercially viable one to the market in 2008. And when we did that, we basically said, what if instead we had a a robotic system that could do this automation task, but it was lightweight and it had a smaller footprint and it costs less. And somebody who didn't have a PhD or didn't even have programming experience could program it to do a job for them that would bring value to that company, right? And so that's what we've been iterating through with all of the different products we brought out is how to make that more accessible. Let's, uh, let's segue just a little bit to something that's brand new in UR. We have recently introduced a brand new robot the UR20. So Lacey, talk about that architecture. 
Talk about the new UR20 architecture, because it's full of innovation. It's not just bigger. It is. Yeah. It's got a lot more than that. We completely redesigned the joint architecture, and then we also went in and completely redesigned many aspects of the software. Um, and from that, I think we got three amazing things. Um, the combination of the new joint architecture and the software brought about a large robot arm that is still collaborative with the smaller footprint and lighter weight mm -hmm. that can be used to do incredibly um, precision demanding tasks that can be used for the full 20 kilogram in the complete work envelope at the top speed and top acceleration still, so not having to degrade your performance. Um, and then also, it is still easy to use just like our E-Series and CB3. So we've carried forward the things that our customers have loved, but we improved things so that when somebody is making that assessment, um, it's, it's easy to say why you would pick yours. There's a lot of things going on out there right now. And it's really interesting. You have both, let's call them the challenges of the industry and the opportunities of the industry. And if I start by the challenges, there's one challenge that overshadows everything. And that is labor shortage. So right now the world is really dealing with labor shortage in manufacturing, but in fact, in many different types of industries mm -hmm. as well. If you take Europe alone, in 2050, there's gonna be 95 million less people in working age than we have today. But at the same time, the world uh, population is increasing. So we will have to produce, recycle, reproduce goods for all the people on the planet. And while you have less people on, in the working age, you really don't only have one option. Automation. That is automation, correct. Yeah, I think we see the same thing in the US. We're looking at a million jobs open right now in manufacturing, and that is projected by 2030 to be 2.4 million. So it, is, it truly is a global problem. Um, what are the other opportunities behind labor? From a, from a labor perspective, moving into automation, and I would say especially robotic automation and collaborative robotic automation as we do, it brings some really interesting opportunities that we see out there. It actually, it goes right into employee happiness. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the dangerous, the dull, and the dirty jobs, suddenly you get to a different setting. Instead of um, feeding a machine with heavy metal parts every day, first machine number one, then machine number two, then machine number three, you get to work with robots. You get to be the person that programs, operates, and keeps the robots going, which is a fun job, Definitely. right? So we actually are also seeing a change of the scenery of the types of jobs people do out there. So that's definitely an opportunity for a more a pleasant job, yeah. a pleasant you know, work life that you can have. Fleur, you and I talked briefly about Industry 5.0 and all those ramifications. Could you talk a little bit about that? I think when people talk about Industry 5.0, they do have different ideas about what that might look like. But there's a very interesting one from the European Commission that says, if you look at the way that industry needs to be in the future, it needs to be much more human-centric than it mm. currently is. It needs to be more sustainable for the environment and it needs to be more resilient. And that links to reshoring, of course. But the interesting thing is that all three parts of that concept are things where our cobots can help. I would agree. Absolutely a bullseye. Right? Because I think we've redefined how humans interact, obviously, with automation. Um, and I, that will definitely carry forward. But I think that automation technology, you know, as we learned going through COVID, um, you know, one day everyone was open. We were going into the office, you know, and that was a normal thing, 8 a.m. or whatever, you're, you're there. Overnight it changed. Everything shut down, right? But people still needed things. We still needed school supplies and food and whatever it was to be you know, delivered at that point because we weren't allowed out of the houses in some cases. Um, and I think that that forced us to reckon with the fact that we're going to have to deal with unknowns. We are going to have to be, you know, speaking to resilience, our businesses, our manufacturing facilities, right, will have to operate in many different ways. So bringing versatility in with those technologies, it should be done so in a way that gives them the potential to address these unknowns. So the versatility shouldn't be done as like a second class requirement. It's a first class requirement. Versatility is an absolute requirement now. Folks, I want to say thank you very much for an excellent session today, and I hope we can do it again. Thank you. Thank you.